Letters from an American Farmer is a series of letters written by French-American writer J. Hector St. John de Crevecou. First published in 1782. Letters from an American Farmer. Letter 12. Distresses of a Frontier Man. I wish for a change of place. The hour is come at last, that I must fly from my house and abandon my farm. But what course shall I steer, enclosed as I am? The climate best adapted to my present situation and humor would be the polar regions, where six months day and six months night divide the dull year, nay, a simple aurora borealis would suffice me. And greatly refresh my eyes, fatigued now by so many disagreeable objects. The severity of those climates. That great gloom, where melancholy dwells, would be perfectly analogous to the turn of my mind. Oh! Could I remove my plantation to the shores of the Obi? Willingly would I dwell in the hut of a Samwide. With cheerfulness would I go and bury myself in the cavern of a Laplander. Could I but carry my family along with me? I would winter at Bello, or Tobolsky, in order to enjoy the peace and innocence of that country. But let me arrive under the pole, or reach the Antipodes. I never can leave behind me the remembrance of the dreadful scenes to which I have been a witness, therefore never can I be happy. Happy, why would I mention that sweet, that enchanting word? Once happiness was our portion, now it is gone from us, and I am afraid not to be enjoyed again by the present generation. Whichever way I look, nothing but the most frightful precipices present themselves to my view in which hundreds of my friends and acquaintances have already perished, of all animals that live on the surface of this planet. What is man when no longer connected with society, or when he finds himself surrounded by a convulsed and a half-dissolved one? He cannot live in solitude, he must belong to some community bound by some ties, however imperfect. Men mutually support and add to the boldness and confidence of each other, the weakness of each is strengthened by the force of the whole. I had never before these calamitous times formed any such ideas, I lived on. Labored and prospered, without having ever studied on what the security of my life and the foundation of my prosperity were established. I perceived them just as they left me. Never was a situation so singularly terrible as mine. In every possible respect, as a member of an extensive society, as a citizen of an inferior division of the same society, as a husband, as a father. As a man who exquisitely feels for the miseries of others as well as for his own. But alas! So much is everything now subverted among us, that the very word misery, with which we were hardly acquainted before, no longer conveys the same ideas, or rather tied with feeling for the miseries of others, every one feels now for himself alone. When I consider myself as connected in all these characters, as bound by so many cords, all uniting in my heart, I am seized with a fever of the mind, I am transported beyond that degree of calmness which is necessary to delineate our thoughts. I feel as if my reason wanted to leave me, as if it would burst its poor weak tenement, again I try to compose myself, I grow cool, and preconceiving the dreadful loss, I endeavor to retain the useful guest. You know the position of our settlement, I need not therefore describe it. To the west it is enclosed by a chain of mountains, reaching to, to the east, the country is as yet but thinly inhabited. We are almost insulated, and the houses are at a considerable distance from each other. From the mountains we have but too much reason to expect our dreadful enemy. The wilderness is a harbor where it is impossible to find them. It is a door through which they can enter our country whenever they please, and, as they seem determined to destroy the whole chain of frontiers, our fate cannot be far distant, from Lake Champlain. Almost all has been conflagrated one after another. What renders these incursions still more terrible is, that they most commonly take place in the dead of the night, we never go to our fields but we are seized with an involuntary fear, which lessens our strength and weakens our labor. No other subject of conversation intervenes between the different accounts, which spread through the country, of successive acts of devastation, and these told in chimney corners, swell themselves in our affrighted imaginations into the most terrific ideas. We never sit down either to dinner or supper, 
but the least noise immediately spreads a general alarm and prevents us from enjoying the comfort of our meals. The very appetite proceeding from labor and peace of mind is gone, we eat just enough to keep us alive, our sleep is disturbed by the most frightful dreams, sometimes I start awake, as if the great hour of danger was come. At other times the howling of our dogs seems to announce the arrival of the enemy, we leap out of bed and run to arms, my poor wife with panting bosom and silent tears, takes leave of me, as if we were to see each other no more. She snatches the youngest children from their beds, who, suddenly awakened, increase by their innocent questions the horror of the dreadful moment. She tries to hide them in the cellar. As if our cellar was inaccessible to the fire. I place all my servants at the windows, and myself at the door, where I am determined to perish. Fear industriously increases every sound, we all listen. Each communicates to the other his ideas and conjectures. We remain thus sometimes for whole hours, our hearts and our minds racked by the most anxious suspense. What a dreadful situation, a thousand times worse than that of a soldier engaged in the midst of the most severe conflict. Sometimes feeling the spontaneous courage of a man. I seem to wish for the decisive minute, the next instant a message from my wife, sent by one of the children, puzzling me beside with their little questions. Unmans me, away goes my courage, and I descend again into the deepest despondency. At last finding that it was a false alarm, we return once more to our beds, but what good can the kind sleep of nature do to us when interrupted by such scenes? Securely placed as you are, you can have no idea of our agitations, but by hearsay, no relation can be equal to what we suffer and to what we feel. Every morning my youngest children are sure to have frightful dreams to relate, in vain I exert my authority to keep them silent. It is not in my power, and these images of their disturbed imagination. Instead of being frivolously looked upon as in the days of our happiness, are on the contrary considered as warnings and sure prognostics of our future fate. I am not a superstitious man, but since our misfortunes, I am grown more timid, and less disposed to treat the doctrine of omens with contempt. Though these evils have been gradual, yet they do not become habitual like other incidental evils. The nearer I view the end of this catastrophe, the more I shudder. But why should I trouble you with such unconnected accounts? Men secure and out of danger are soon fatigued with mournful details, can you enter with me into fellowship with all these afflictive sensations? Have you a tear ready to shed over the approaching ruin of a once opulent and substantial family? Read this I pray with the eyes of sympathy, with a tender sorrow, pity the lot of those whom you once called your friends. Who were once surrounded with plenty, ease, and perfect security, but who now expect every night to be their last, and who are as wretched as criminals under an impending sentence of the law. As a member of a large society which extends to many parts of the world, my connection with it is too distant to be as strong as that which binds me to the inferior division in the midst of which I live. I am told that the great nation, of which we are a part, is just, wise, and free, beyond any other on earth, within its own insular boundaries, but not always so to its distant conquests, I shall not repeat all I have heard, because I cannot believe half of it. As a citizen of a smaller society, I find that any kind of opposition to its now prevailing sentiments, immediately begets hatred, how easily do men pass from loving, to hating and cursing one another. I am a lover of peace, what must I do? I am divided between the respect I feel for the ancient connection, and the fear of innovations, with the consequence of which I am not well acquainted, as they are embraced by my own countrymen. I am conscious that I was happy before this unfortunate revolution. I feel that I am no longer so, therefore I regret the change. This is the only mode of reasoning adapted to persons in my situation. If I attach myself to the mother country, which is three thousand miles from me. I become what is called an enemy to my own region, if I follow the rest of my countrymen, I become opposed to our ancient masters. Both extremes appear equally dangerous to a person of so little weight and consequence as I am, whose energy and example are of no avail. 
as to the argument on which the dispute is founded. I know little about it. Much has been said and written on both sides, but who has a judgment capacious and clear enough to decide? The great moving principles which actuate both parties are much hid from vulgar eyes. Like mine, nothing but the plausible and the probable are offered to our contemplation. The innocent class are always the victim of the few, they are in all countries and at all times the inferior agents, on which the popular phantom is erected, they clamor, and must toil, and bleed. And are always sure of meeting with oppression and rebuke. It is for the sake of the great leaders on both sides, that so much blood must be spilt. That of the people is counted as nothing. Great events are not achieved for us, though it is by us that they are principally accomplished. By the arms, the sweat, the lives of the people. Books tell me so much that they inform me of nothing. Sophistry, the bane of freemen. Launches forth in all her deceiving attire. After all, most men reason from passions, and shall such an ignorant individual as I am decide. And say this side is right, that side is wrong? Sentiment and feeling are the only guides I know. Alas, how should I unravel an argument, in which reason herself hath given way to brutality and bloodshed? What then must I do? I ask the wisest lawyers, the ablest casuists, the warmest patriots, for I mean honestly. Great source of wisdom. Inspire me with light sufficient to guide my benighted steps out of this intricate maze. Shall I discard all my ancient principles? Shall I renounce that name, that nation which I held once so respectable? I feel the powerful attraction, the sentiments they inspired grew with my earliest knowledge. And were grafted upon the first rudiments of my education. On the other hand, shall I arm myself against that country where I first drew breath, against the playmates of my youth, my bosom friends, my acquaintance? The idea makes me shudder. Must I be called a parricide, a traitor, a villain, lose the esteem of all those whom I love, to preserve my own, be shunned like a rattlesnake, or be pointed at like a bear? I have neither heroism nor magnanimity enough to make so great a sacrifice. Here I am tied, I am fastened by numerous strings, nor do I repine at the pressure they cause, ignorant as I am, I can pervade the utmost extent of the calamities which have already overtaken our poor afflicted country. I can see the great and accumulated ruin yet extending itself as far as the theatre of war has reached. I hear the groans of thousands of families now ruined and desolated by our aggressors. I cannot count the multitude of orphans this war has made. Nor ascertain the immensity of blood we have lost. Some have asked, whether it was a crime to resist, to repel some parts of this evil. Others have asserted, that a resistance so general makes pardon unattainable, and repentance useless, and dividing the crime among so many, renders it imperceptible. What one party calls meritorious, the other denominates flagitious. These opinions vary, contract, or expand, like the events of the war on which they are founded. What can an insignificant man do in the midst of these jarring contradictory parties, equally hostile to persons situated as I am? And after all who will be the really guilty? Those most certainly who fail of success. Our fate, the fate of thousands, is then necessarily involved in the dark wheel of fortune. Why then so many useless reasonings, we are the sport of fate. Farewell education, principles, love of our country, farewell, all are become useless to the generality of us, he who governs himself according to what he calls his principles, may be punished either by one party or the other, for those very principles. He who proceeds without principle, as chance, timidity, or self-preservation directs, will not perhaps fare better but he will be less blamed. What are we in the great scale of events? We poor defenseless frontier inhabitants. What is it to the gazing world, whether we breathe or whether we die? Whatever virtue, whatever merit and disinterestedness we may exhibit in our secluded retreats, of what avail? We are like the Bismayers destroyed by the plough, whose destruction prevents not the future crop. Self-preservation, therefore, the rule of nature, seems to be the best rule of conduct. 
What good can we do by vain resistance, by useless efforts? The cool, the distant spectator, placed in safety, may arraign me for ingratitude. May bring forth the principles of Solon or Montesquieu, he may look on me as willfully guilty, he may call me by the most opprobrious names. Secure from personal danger, his warm imagination, undisturbed by the least agitation of the heart, will expatiate freely on this grand question, and will consider this extended field, but as exhibiting the double scene of attack and defence. To him the object becomes abstracted, the intermediate glares, the perspective distance and a variety of opinions unimpaired by affections, presents to his mind but one set of ideas. Here he proclaims the high guilt of the one. And there the right of the other, but let him come and reside with us one single month, let him pass with us through all the successive hours of necessary toil, terror and affright, let him watch with us, his musket in his hand, through tedious, sleepless nights. His imagination furrowed by the keen chisel of every passion, let his wife and his children become exposed to the most dreadful hazards of death, let the existence of his property depend on a single spark, blown by the breath of an enemy, let him tremble with us in our fields, shudder at the rustling of every leaf, let his heart, the seat of the most affecting passions, be powerfully wrung by hearing the melancholy end of his relations and friends, let him trace on the map the progress of these desolous yarn, let his alarmed imagination predict to him the night, the dreadful night when it may be his turn to perish, as so many have perished before. Observe then, whether the man will not get the better of the citizen, whether his political maxims will not vanish. Yes, he will cease to glow so warmly with the glory of the metropolis, all his wishes will be turned toward the preservation of his family. Oh, were he situated where I am, were his house perpetually filled, as mine is, with miserable victims just escaped from the flames and the scalping knife. Telling of barbarities and murders that make human nature tremble, his situation would suspend every political reflection, and expel every abstract idea. My heart is full and involuntarily takes hold of any notion from whence it can receive ideal ease or relief. I am informed that the king has the most numerous, as well as the fairest, progeny of children, of any potentate now in the world, he may be a great king, but he must feel as we common mortals do, in the good wishes he forms for their lives and prosperity. His mind no doubt often springs forward on the wings of anticipation, and contemplates us as happily settled in the world. If a poor frontier inhabitant may be allowed to suppose this great personage the first in our system, to be exposed but for one hour, to the exquisite pangs we so often feel, would not the preservation of so numerous a family engross all his thoughts, would not the ideas of dominion and other felicities attendant on royalty all vanish in the hour of danger? The regal character, however sacred, would be superseded by the stronger, because more natural one of man and father. Oh! Did he but know the circumstances of this horrid war, I am sure he would put a stop to that long destruction of parents and children. I am sure that while he turned his ears to state policy, he would attentively listen also to the dictates of nature, that great parent, for, as a good king, he no doubt wishes to create, to spare, and to protect, as she does. Must I then, in order to be called a faithful subject, coolly, and philosophically say, it is necessary for the good of Britain, that my children's brains should be dashed against the walls of the house in which they were reared. That my wife should be stabbed and scalped before my face. That I should be either murdered or captivated, or that for greater expedition we should all be locked up and burnt to ashes as the family of the bee. N. Was. Must I with meekness wait for that last pitch of desolation, and receive with perfect resignation so hard a fate, from ruffians, acting at such a distance from the eyes of any superior, monsters, left to the wild impulses of the wildest nature? Could the lions of Africa be transported here and let loose, they would no doubt kill us in order to prey upon our carcasses. But their appetites would not require so many victims. Shall I wait to be punished with death, or else to be stripped of all food and raiment, reduced to despair without redress and without hope? Shall those who may escape, see everything they hold dear destroyed and gone? Shall those few survivors, 
lurking in some obscure corner, deplore in vain the fate of their families. Moreover, parents either captivated, butchered, or burned. Roam among our wilds, and wait for death at the foot of some tree, without a murmur, or without a sigh, for the good of the cause? No, it is impossible. So astonishing a sacrifice is not to be expected from human nature, it must belong to beings of an inferior or superior order, actuated by less or by more refined principles. Even those great personages who are so far elevated above the common ranks of men. Those, I mean, who wield and direct so many thunders. Those who have let loose against us these demons of war, could they be transported here, and metamorphosed into simple planters as we are? They would, from being the arbiters of human destiny, sink into miserable victims, they would feel and exclaim as we do and be as much at a loss what line of conduct to prosecute. Do you well comprehend the difficulties of our situation? If we stay we are sure to perish at one time or another, no vigilance on our part can save us. If we retire, we know not where to go, every house is filled with refugees as wretched as ourselves, and if we remove we become beggars. The property of farmers is not like that of merchants. And absolute poverty is worse than death. If we take up arms to defend ourselves, we are denominated rebels, should we not be rebels against nature, could we be shamefully passive? Shall we then, like martyrs, glory in an allegiance, now become useless, and voluntarily expose ourselves to a species of desolation which, though it ruin us entirely, yet enriches not our ancient masters? By this inflexible and sullen attachment, we shall be despised by our countrymen, and destroyed by our ancient friends, whatever we may say, whatever merit we may claim, will not shelter us from those indiscriminate blows. Given by hired banditti, animated by all those passions which urge men to shed the blood of others, how bitter the thought! On the contrary, blows received by the hands of those from whom we expected protection, extinguish ancient respect, and urge us to self-defense. Perhaps to revenge, this is the path which nature herself points out, as well to the civilized as to the uncivilized. The creator of hearts has himself stamped on them those propensities at their first formation, and must we then daily receive this treatment from a power once so loved? The fox flies or deceives the hounds that pursue him, the bear, when overtaken. Boldly resists and attacks them, the hen, the very timid hen, fights for the preservation of her chickens, nor does she decline to attack, and to meet on the wing even the swift kite. Shall man, then, provided both with instinct and reason, unmoved, unconcerned, and passive, see his subsistence consumed? and his progeny either ravished from him or murdered? Shall fictitious reason extinguish the unerring impulse of instinct? No, my former respect, my former attachment vanishes with my safety, that respect and attachment was purchased by protection, and it has ceased. Could not the great nation we belong to have accomplished her designs by means of her numerous armies, by means of those fleets which cover the ocean? Must those who are masters of two-thirds of the trade of the world, who have in their hands the power which almighty gold can give, who possess a species of wealth that increases with their desires, must they establish their conquest with our insignificant innocent blood? Must I then bid farewell to Britain, to that renowned country? Must I renounce a name so ancient and so venerable? Alas, she herself, that once indulgent parent, forces me to take up arms against her. She herself, first inspired the most unhappy citizens of our remote districts, with the thoughts of shedding the blood of those whom they used to call by the name of friends and brethren. That great nation which now convulses the world, which hardly knows the extent of her Indian kingdoms. Which looks toward the universal monarchy of trade, of industry, of riches, of power. Why must she strew our poor frontiers with the carcasses of her friends, with the wrecks of our insignificant villages, in which there is no gold? When, oppressed by painful recollection, I revolve all these scattered ideas in my mind. When I contemplate my situation, and the thousand streams of evil with which I am surrounded, when I descend into the particular tendency even of the remedy I have proposed. I am convulsed. 
convulsed sometimes to that degree, as to be tempted to exclaim. Why has the master of the world permitted so much indiscriminate evil throughout every part of this poor planet, at all times, and among all kinds of people? It ought surely to be the punishment of the wicked only. I bring that cup to my lips, of which I must soon taste, and shudder at its bitterness. What then is life, I ask myself, is it a gracious gift? No, it is too bitter, a gift means something valuable conferred, but life appears to be a mere accident, and of the worst kind, we are born to be victims of diseases and passions, of mischances and death. Better not to be than to be miserable. Thus impiously I roam, I fly from one erratic thought to another, and my mind, irritated by these acrimonious reflections, is ready sometimes to lead me to dangerous extremes of violence. When I recollect that I am a father, and a husband, the return of these endearing ideas strikes deep into my heart. Alas! They once made it to glow with pleasure and with every ravishing exultation, but now they fill it with sorrow. At other times. My wife industriously rouses me out of these dreadful meditations, and soothes me by all the reasoning she is mistress of, but her endeavours only serve to make me more miserable, by reflecting that she must share with all these calamities, the bare apprehensions of which I am afraid will subvert her reason. Nor can I with patience think that a beloved wife, my faithful helpmate, throughout all my rural schemes, the principal hand which has assisted me in rearing the prosperous fabric of ease and independence I lately possessed, as well as my children, those tenants of my heart, should daily and nightly be exposed to such a cruel fate. Self-preservation is above all political precepts and rules, and even superior to the dearest opinions of our minds, a reasonable accommodation of ourselves to the various exigencies of the time in which we live, is the most irresistible precept. To this great evil I must seek some sort of remedy adapted to remove or to palliate it, situated as I am, what steps should I take that will neither injure nor insult any of the parties, and at the same time save my family from that certain destruction which awaits it, if I remain here much longer. Could I ensure them bread, safety, and subsistence, not the bread of idleness, but that earned by proper labor as heretofore? Could this be accomplished by the sacrifice of my life, I would willingly give it up. I attest before heaven, that it is only for these I would wish to live and to toil, for these whom I have brought into this miserable existence. I resemble, methinks, one of the stones of a ruined arch, still retaining that pristine form that anciently fitted the place I occupied, but the centre is tumbled down. I can be nothing until I am replaced, either in the former circle, or in some stronger one. I see one on a smaller scale, and at a considerable distance, but it is within my power to reach it, and since I have ceased to consider myself as a member of the ancient state now convulsed. I willingly descend into an inferior one. I will revert into a state approaching nearer to that of nature, unencumbered either with voluminous laws, or contradictory codes. Often galling the very necks of those whom they protect, and at the same time sufficiently remote from the brutality of unconnected savage nature. Do you, my friend, perceive the path I have found out? It is that which leads to the tenants of the great village of where, far removed from the accursed neighborhood of Europeans, its inhabitants live with more ease, decency, and peace, than you imagine, where, though governed by no laws, yet find, in uncontaminated simple manners all that laws can afford. Their system is sufficiently complete to answer all the primary wants of man, and to constitute him a social being, such as he ought to be in the great forest of nature. There it is that I have resolved at any rate to transport myself and family. An eccentric thought, you may say, thus to cut asunder all former connections, and to form new ones with a people whom nature has stamped with such different characteristics. But as the happiness of my family is the only object of my wishes, I care very little where we be, or where we go, provided that we are safe, and all united together. Our new calamities being shared equally by all, will become lighter, our mutual affection for each other, will in this great transmutation become the strongest link of our new society. Will afford us every joy we can receive on a foreign soil, and preserve us in unity, 
as the gravity and coherency of matter prevents the world from dissolution. Blame me not, it would be cruel in you, it would beside be entirely useless, for when you receive this we shall be on the wing. When we think all hopes are gone, must we, like poor pusillanimous wretches, despair and die? No, I perceive before me a few resources, though through many dangers, which I will explain to you hereafter. It is not, believe me, a disappointed ambition which leads me to take this step, it is the bitterness of my situation. It is the impossibility of knowing what better measure to adopt, my education fitted me for nothing more than the most simple occupations of life, I am but a feller of trees, a cultivator of land, the most honorable title an American can have. I have no exploits, no discoveries, no inventions to boast of. I have cleared about 370 acres of land, some for the plow, some for the scythe, and this has occupied many years of my life. I have never possessed, or wished to possess anything more than what could be earned or produced by the united industry of my family. I wanted nothing more than to live at home independent and tranquil. And to teach my children how to provide the means of a future ample subsistence, founded on labor, like that of their father. This is the career of life I have pursued, and that which I had marked out for them and for which they seemed to be so well calculated by their inclinations, and by their constitutions. But now these pleasing expectations are gone, we must abandon the accumulated industry of nineteen years, we must fly we hardly know whither, through the most impervious paths, and become members of a new and strange community. Oh, virtue! Is this all the reward thou hast to confer on thy votaries? Either thou art only a chimera, or thou art a timid useless being, soon affrighted, when ambition, thy great adversary, dictates, when war echoes the dreadful sounds, and poor helpless individuals are mowed down by its cruel reapers like useless grass. I have at all times generously relieved what few distressed people I have met with, I have encouraged the industrious, my house has always been open to travellers. I have not lost a month in illness since I have been a man, I have caused upwards of an hundred and twenty families to remove hither. Many of them I have led by the hand in the days of their first trial, distant as I am from many places of worship or school of education, I have been the pastor of my family, and the teacher of many of my neighbours. I have learnt them as well as I could, the gratitude they owe to God, the father of harvests, and their duties to man, I have been as useful a subject, ever obedient to the laws, ever vigilant to see them respected and observed. My wife hath faithfully followed the same line within her province, no woman was ever a better economist, or spun or wove better linen, yet we must perish, perish like wild beasts, included within a ring of fire. Yes, I will cheerfully embrace that resource, it is an holy inspiration, by night and by day. It presents itself to my mind, I have carefully revolved the scheme, I have considered in all its future effects and tendencies. The new mode of living we must pursue, without salt, without spices, without linen and with little other clothing, the art of hunting, we must acquire, the new manners we must adopt, the new language we must speak. The dangers attending the education of my children we must endure. These changes may appear more terrific at a distance perhaps than when grown familiar by practice, what is it to us, whether we eat well made pastry, or pounded allegriches, well roasted beef, or smoked venison, cabbages, or squashes? Whether we wear neat homespun or good beaver? Whether we sleep on feather beds, or on bear skins? The difference is not worth attending to. The difficulty of the language, fear of some great intoxication among the Indians, finally, the apprehension lest my younger children should be caught by that singular charm, so dangerous at their tender years, are the only considerations that startle me. By what power does it come to pass, that children who have been adopted when young among these people, can never be prevailed on to readopt European manners? Many an anxious parent I have seen last war, who at the return of the peace, went to the Indian villages where they knew their children had been carried in captivity. When to their inexpressible sorrow, they found them so perfectly Indianized, that many knew them no longer, and those whose more advanced ages permitted them to recollect their fathers and mothers. 
absolutely refused to follow them, and ran to their adopted parents for protection against the effusions of love their unhappy real parents lavished on them. Incredible as this may appear. I have heard it asserted in a thousand instances, among persons of credit. In the village of where I purpose to go, there lived, about fifteen years ago, an Englishman and a Swede, whose history would appear moving, had I time to relate it. They were grown to the age of men when they were taken, they happily escaped the great punishment of war captives, and were obliged to marry the squaws who had saved their lives by adoption. By the force of habit, they became at last thoroughly naturalized to this wild course of life. While I was there, their friends sent them a considerable sum of money to ransom themselves with. The Indians, their old masters, gave them their choice, and without requiring any consideration, told them, that they had been long as free as themselves. They chose to remain, and the reasons they gave me would greatly surprise you. The most perfect freedom, the ease of living, the absence of those cares and corroding solicitudes which so often prevail with us. The peculiar goodness of the soil they cultivated, for they did not trust altogether to hunting, all these, and many more motives. Which I have forgot, made them prefer that life, of which we entertain such dreadful opinions. It cannot be, therefore, so bad as we generally conceive it to be, there must be in their social bonds something singularly captivating, and far superior to anything to be boasted of among us, for thousands of Europeans are Indians and we have no examples of even one of those aborigines having from choice become Europeans. There must be something more congenial to our native dispositions. Than the fictitious society in which we live, or else why should children, and even grown persons, become in a short time so invincibly attached to it? There must be something very bewitching in their manners, something very indelible and marked by the very hands of nature. For, take a young Indian lad give him the best education you possibly can, load him with your bounty. With presents, nay with riches, yet he will secretly long for his native woods, which you would imagine he must have long since forgot, and on the first opportunity he can possibly find. You will see him voluntarily leave behind him all you have given him, and return with inexpressible joy to lie on the mats of his fathers. Mr., some years ago, received from a good old Indian, who died in his house, a young lad. Of nine years of age, his grandson. He kindly educated him with his children, and bestowed on him the same care and attention in respect to the memory of his venerable grandfather, who was a worthy man. He intended to give him a genteel trade. But in the spring season when all the family went to the woods to make their maple sugar, he suddenly disappeared, and it was not until seventeen months after, that his benefactor heard he had reached the village of Bald Eagle, where he still dwelt. Let us say what we will of them, of their inferior organs, of their want of bread, etc., they are as stout and well made as the Europeans. Without temples, without priests, without kings, and without laws, they are in many instances superior to us, and the proofs of what I advance, are, that they live without care sleep without inquietude, take life as it comes. Bearing all its asperities with unparalleled patience, and die without any kind of apprehension for what they have done, or for what they expect to meet with hereafter. What system of philosophy can give us so many necessary qualifications for happiness? They most certainly are much more closely connected with nature than we are, they are her immediate children, the inhabitants of the woods are her undefiled offspring, those of the plains are her degenerated breed. Far, very far removed from her primitive laws, from her original design. It is therefore resolved on. I will either die in the attempt or succeed, better perish altogether in one fatal hour, than to suffer what we daily endure. I do not expect to enjoy in the village of an uninterrupted happiness. It cannot be our lot, let us live where we will, I am not founding my future prosperity on golden dreams. Place mankind where you will, they must always have adverse circumstances to struggle with, from nature, accidents, constitution, from seasons, from that great combination of mischances which perpetually lead us to new diseases, to poverty, etc. 
who knows but I may meet in this new situation, some accident from whence may spring up new sources of unexpected prosperity. Who can be presumptuous enough to predict all the good? Who can foresee all the evils, which strew the paths of our lives? But after all, I cannot but recollect what sacrifice I am going to make, what amputation I am going to suffer, what transition I am going to experience. Pardon my repetitions, my wild, my trifling reflections, they proceed from the agitations of my mind, and the fullness of my heart, the action of thus retracing them seems to lighten the burden, and to exhilarate my spirits, this is besides the last letter you will receive from me, I would fain tell you all, though I hardly know how. Oh! In the hours, in the moments of my greatest anguish, could I intuitively represent to you that variety of thought which crowds on my mind. You would have reason to be surprised, and to doubt of their possibility. Shall we ever meet again? If we should, where will it be? On the wild shores of. If it be my doom to end my days there. I will greatly improve them, and perhaps make room for a few more families. Who will choose to retire from the fury of a storm, the agitated billows of which will yet roar for many years on our extended shores? Perhaps I may repossess my house, if it be not burnt down, but how will my improvements look? Why, half defaced, bearing the strong marks of abandonment, and of the ravages of war. However, at present I give everything over for lost, I will bid a long farewell to what I leave behind. If ever I repossess it, I shall receive it as a gift, as a reward for my conduct and fortitude. Do not imagine, however, that I am a stoic by no means, I must, on the contrary, confess to you, that I feel the keenest regret, at abandoning an house which I have in some measure reared with my own hands. Yes, perhaps I may never revisit those fields which I have cleared. Those trees which I have planted, those meadows which, in my youth, were a hideous wilderness, now converted by my industry into rich pastures and pleasant lawns. If in Europe it is praiseworthy to be attached to paternal inheritances, how much more natural, how much more powerful must the tie be with us, who, if I may be permitted the expression, are the founders, the creators of our own farms. When I see my table surrounded with my blooming offspring, all united in the bonds of the strongest affection, it kindles in my paternal heart a variety of tumultuous sentiments, which none but a father and a husband in my situation can feel or describe. Perhaps I may see my wife, my children. Often distressed, involuntarily recalling to their minds the ease and abundance which they enjoyed under the paternal roof. Perhaps I may see them want that bread which I now leave behind. Overtaken by diseases and penury, rendered more bitter by the recollection of former days of opulence and plenty. Perhaps I may be assailed on every side by unforeseen accidents, which I shall not be able to prevent or to alleviate. Can I contemplate such images without the most unutterable emotions? My fate is determined, but I have not determined it, you may assure yourself, without having undergone the most painful conflicts of a variety of passions, interest, love of ease, disappointed views, and pleasing expectations frustrated. I shuddered at the review. Would to God I was master of the stoical tranquility of that magnanimous sect. Oh! that I were possessed of those sublime lessons which Apollonius of Chalcis gave to the Emperor Antoninus. I could then with much more propriety guide the helm of my little bark, which is soon to be freighted with all that I possess most dear on earth, through this stormy passage to a safe harbour. And when there, become to my fellow passengers, a surer guide, a brighter example, a pattern more worthy of imitation. Throughout all the new scenes they must pass, and the new career they must traverse. I have observed notwithstanding. The means hitherto made use of, to arm the principal nations against our frontiers. Yet they have not, they will not take up the hatchet against a people who have done them no harm. The passions necessary to urge these people to war, cannot be roused, they cannot feel the stings of vengeance, the thirst of which alone can compel them to shed blood, far superior in their motives of action to the Europeans, who for sixpence per day, may be engaged to shed that of any people on earth. 
They know nothing of the nature of our disputes, they have no ideas of such revolutions as this, a civil division of a village or tribe, are events which have never been recorded in their traditions, many of them know very well that they have too long been the dupes and the victims of both parties, foolishly arming for our sakes, sometimes against each other, sometimes against our white enemies. They consider us as born on the same land, and, though they have no reasons to love us, yet they seem carefully to avoid entering into this quarrel, from whatever motives. I am speaking of those nations with which I am best acquainted, a few hundreds of the worst kind mixed with whites, worse than themselves, are now hired by Great Britain, to perpetuate those dreadful incursions. In my youth I traded with the under the conduct of my uncle, and always traded justly and equitably, some of them remember it to this day. Happily their village is far removed from the dangerous neighborhood of the whites, I sent a man last spring to it, who understands the woods extremely well, and who speaks their language, he is just returned, after several weeks absence. And has brought me, as I had flattered myself, a string of thirty purple wampum, as a token that their honest chief will spare us half of his wigwam until we have time to erect one. He has sent me word that they have land in plenty. Of which they are not so covetous as the whites, that we may plant for ourselves, and that in the meantime he will procure for us some corn and some meat, that fish is plenty in the waters of. And that the village to which he had laid open my proposals, have no objection to our becoming dwellers with them. I have not yet communicated these glad tidings to my wife, nor do I know how to do it. I tremble lest she should refuse to follow me, lest the sudden idea of this removal rushing on her mind, might be too powerful. I flatter myself I shall be able to accomplish it, and to prevail on her. I fear nothing but the effects of her strong attachment to her relations. I will willingly let you know how I purpose to remove my family to so great a distance but it would become unintelligible to you, because you are not acquainted with the geographical situation of this part of the country. Suffice it for you to know, that with about twenty-three miles land carriage, I am enabled to perform the rest by water, and when once afloat, I care not whether it be two or three hundred miles. I propose to send all our provisions, furniture, and clothes to my wife's father, who approves of the scheme and to reserve nothing but a few necessary articles of covering, trusting to the furs of the chase for our future apparel. Were we imprudently to encumber ourselves too much with baggage, we should never reach to the waters of which is the most dangerous as well as the most difficult part of our journey, and yet but a trifle in point of distance. I intend to say to my negroes in the name of God, be free, my honest lads, I thank you for your past services, go, from henceforth, and work for yourselves, look on me as your old friend, and fellow labourer, be sober, frugal, and industrious, and you need not fear earning a comfortable subsistence. Lest my countrymen should think that I am gone to join the incendiaries of our frontiers, I intend to write a letter to Mr., to inform him of our retreat, and of the reasons that have urged me to it. The man whom I sent to, village, is to accompany us also, and a very useful companion he will be on every account. You may therefore, by means of anticipation, behold me under the wigwam, I am so well acquainted with the principal manners of these people, that I entertain not the least apprehension from them. I rely more securely on their strong hospitality, than on the witnessed compacts of many Europeans. As soon as possible after my arrival, I design to build myself a wigwam. After the same manner and size with the rest, in order to avoid being thought singular, or giving occasion for any railleries, though these people are seldom guilty of such European follies. I shall erect it hard by the lands which they propose to allot me, and will endeavour that my wife, my children, and myself may be adopted soon after our arrival. Thus becoming truly inhabitants of their village, we shall immediately occupy that rank within the pale of their society, which will afford us all the amends we can possibly expect for the loss we have met with by the convulsions of our own. According to their customs we shall likewise receive names from them, by which we shall always be known. My youngest children shall learn to swim, and to shoot with the bow, 
that they may acquire such talents as will necessarily raise them into some degree of esteem among the Indian lads of their own age. The rest of us must hunt with the hunters. I have been for several years an expert marksman, but I dread lest the imperceptible charm of Indian education may seize my younger children and give them such a propensity to that mode of life as may preclude their returning to the manners and customs of their parents. I have but one remedy to prevent this great evil, and that is to employ them in the labor of the fields as much as I can. I am even resolved to make their daily subsistence depend altogether on it. As long as we keep ourselves busy in tilling the earth, there is no fear of any of us becoming wild. Semicolon it is the chase and the food it procures, that have this strange effect. Excuse a simile. Those hogs which range in the woods, and to whom grain is given once a week, preserve their former degree of tameness, but if, on the contrary, they are reduced to live on ground nuts, and on what they can get, they soon become wild and fierce. For my part, I can plough, sow, and hunt as occasion may require, but my wife, deprived of wool and flax, will have no room for industry, what is she then to do? Like the other squaws, she must cook for us the nasamp, the ninchik, and such other preparations of corn as are customary among these people. She must learn to bake squashes and pumpkins under the ashes. To slice and smoke the meat of our own killing, in order to preserve it, she must cheerfully adopt the manners and customs of her neighbors, in their dress, deportment, conduct, and internal economy. In all respects, surely if we can have fortitude enough to quit all we have, to remove so far, and to associate with people so different from us, these necessary compliances are but part of the scheme. The change of garments, when those they carry with them are worn out, will not be the least of my wife's and daughter's concerns, though I am in hopes that self-love will invent some sort of reparation. Perhaps you would not believe that there are in the woods looking glasses, and paint of every color, and that the inhabitants take as much pains to adorn their faces and their bodies, to fix their bracelets of silver, and plait their hair, as our forefathers the Picts used to do in the time of the Romans. Not that I would wish to see either my wife or daughter adopt those savage customs, we can live in great peace and harmony with them without descending to every article, the interruption of trade hath, I hope, suspended this mode of dress. My wife understands inoculation perfectly well, she inoculated all our children one after another, and has successfully performed the operation on several scores of people, who, scattered here and there through our woods, were too far removed from all medical assistance. If we can persuade but one family to submit to it, and it succeeds, we shall then be as happy as our situation will admit of it will raise her into some degree of consideration, for whoever is useful in any society will always be respected. If we are so fortunate as to carry one family through a disorder, which is the plague among these people, I trust to the force of example, we shall then become truly necessary, valued, and beloved, we indeed owe every kind office to a society of men who so readily offer to assist us into their social partnership, and to extend to my family the shelter of their village the strength of their adoption, and even the dignity of their names. God grant us a prosperous beginning, we may then hope to be of more service to them than even missionaries who have been sent to preach to them a gospel they cannot understand. As to religion, our mode of worship will not suffer much by this removal from a cultivated country, into the bosom of the woods, for it cannot be much simpler than that which we have followed here these many years. And I will with as much care as I can, redouble my attention, and twice a week, retrace to them the great outlines of their duty to God and to man. I will read and expound to them some part of the Decalogue, which is the method I have pursued ever since I married. Half a dozen of acres on the shores of the soil of which I know well, will yield us a great abundance of all we want, I will make it a point to give the overplus to such Indians as shall be most unfortunate in their huntings, I will persuade them, if I can, to till a little more land than they do, and not to trust so much to the produce of the chase. To encourage them still farther, I will give a quern to every six families, I have built many for our poor back settlers, it being often the want of mills which prevents them from raising grain. As I am a carpenter, 
I can build my own plow, and can be of great service to many of them, my example alone, may rouse the industry of some, and serve to direct others in their labors. The difficulties of the language will soon be removed, in my evening conversations, I will endeavor to make them regulate the trade of their village in such a manner as that those pests of the continent, those Indian traders, may not come within a certain distance. And there they shall be obliged to transact their business before the old people. I am in hopes that the constant respect which is paid to the elders, and shame, may prevent the young hunters from infringing this regulation. The son of, will soon be made acquainted with our schemes. And I trust that the power of love, and the strong attachment he professes for my daughter, may bring him along with us, he will make an excellent hunter, young and vigorous, he will equal in dexterity the stoutest man in the village. Had it not been for this fortunate circumstance, there would have been the greatest danger, for however I respect the simple, the inoffensive society of these people in their villages, the strongest prejudices would make me abhor any alliance with them in blood. Disagreeable no doubt, to nature's intentions which have strongly divided us by so many indelible characters. In the days of our sickness, we shall have recourse to their medical knowledge, which is well calculated for the simple diseases to which they are subject. Thus shall we metamorphose ourselves, from neat, decent, opulent planters, surrounded with every conveniency which our external labor and internal industry could give, into a still simpler people divested of everything beside hope, food, and the raiment of the woods. Abandoning the large framed house, to dwell under the wigwam, and the feather bed, to lie on the mat, or bear's skin. There shall we sleep undisturbed by fruitful dreams and apprehensions, rest and peace of mind will make us the most ample amends for what we shall leave behind. These blessings cannot be purchased too dear. Too long have we been deprived of them. I would cheerfully go even to the Mississippi, to find that repose to which we have been so long strangers. My heart sometimes seems tired with beating, it wants rest like my eyelids which feel oppressed with so many watchings. These are the component parts of my scheme, the success of each of which appears feasible, from whence I flatter myself with the probable success of the whole. Still the danger of Indian education returns to my mind, and alarms me much, then again I contrast it with the education of the times, both appear to be equally pregnant with evils. Reason points out the necessity of choosing the least dangerous, which I must consider as the only good within my reach, I persuade myself that industry and labor will be a sovereign preservative against the dangers of the former, but I consider, at the same time, that the share of labor and industry which is intended to procure but a simple subsistence, with hardly any superfluity, cannot have the same restrictive effects on our minds as when we tilled the earth on a more extensive scale. The surplus could be then realized into solid wealth, and at the same time that this realization rewarded our past labors, it engrossed and fixed the attention of the laborer, and cherished in his mind the hope of future riches. In order to supply this great deficiency of industrious motives, and to hold out to them a real object to prevent the fatal consequences of this sort of apathy, I will keep an exact account of all that shall be gathered, and give each of them a regular credit for the amount of it to be paid them in real property at the return of peace. Thus, though seemingly toiling for bare subsistence on a foreign land, they shall entertain the pleasing prospect of seeing the sum of their labors one day realized either in legacies or gifts, equal if not superior to it. The yearly expense of the clothes which they would have received at home, and of which they will then be deprived, shall likewise be added to their credit, thus I flatter myself that they will more cheerfully wear the blanket, the matchcoat, and the moccasins. Whatever success they may meet with in hunting or fishing, shall only be considered as recreation and pastime, I shall thereby prevent them from estimating their skill in the chase as an important and necessary accomplishment. I mean to say to them, you shall hunt and fish merely to show your new companions that you are not inferior to them in point of sagacity and dexterity. Were I to send them to such schools as the interior parts of our settlements afford at present? What can they learn there? How could I support them there? What must become of me, am I to proceed on my voyage, and leave them? That I never could submit to. 
instead of the perpetual discordant noise of disputes so common among us, instead of those scolding scenes, frequent in every house, they will observe nothing but silence at home and abroad. A singular appearance of peace and concord are the first characteristics which strike you in the villages of these people. Nothing can be more pleasing, nothing surprises an European so much as the silence and harmony which prevails among them, and in each family. Except when disturbed by that accursed spirit given them by the wood rangers in exchange for their furs. If my children learn nothing of geometrical rules, the use of the compass, or of the Latin tongue, they will learn and practice sobriety, for rum can no longer be sent to these people, they will learn that modesty and diffidence for which the young Indians are so remarkable, they will consider labor as the most essential qualification. Hunting as the second. They will prepare themselves in the prosecution of our small rural schemes, carried on for the benefit of our little community, to extend them further when each shall receive his inheritance. Their tender minds will cease to be agitated by perpetual alarms, to be made cowards by continual terrors, if they acquire in the village of. Such an awkwardness of deportment and appearances would render them ridiculous in our gay capitals, they will imbibe, I hope, a confirmed taste for that simplicity, which so well becomes the cultivators of the land. If I cannot teach them any of those professions which sometimes embellish and support our society, I will show them how to hew wood, how to construct their own ploughs, and with a few tools how to supply themselves with every necessary implement. Both in the house and in the field. If they are hereafter obliged to confess, that they belong to no one particular church, I shall have the consolation of teaching them that great, that primary worship which is the foundation of all others. If they do not fear God according to the tenets of any one seminary, they shall learn to worship him upon the broad scale of nature. The Supreme Being does not reside in peculiar churches or communities, he is equally the great Manitou of the woods and of the plains. And even in the gloom, the obscurity of those very woods, his justice may be as well understood and felt as in the most sumptuous temples. Each worship with us, hath, you know, its peculiar political tendency. There it has none but to inspire gratitude and truth, their tender minds shall receive no other idea of the Supreme Being, than that of the Father of all men, who requires nothing more of us than what tends to make each other happy. We shall say with them, Sung Wanir, Asak or Unk Yorga, Nshorzenitwek, Nesalanga. Our Father, be thy will done in earth as it is in great heaven. Perhaps my imagination gilds too strongly this distant prospect, yet it appears founded on so few, and simple principles, that there is not the same probability of adverse incidents as in more complex schemes. These vague rambling contemplations which I here faithfully retrace, carry me sometimes to a great distance. I am lost in the anticipation of the various circumstances attending this proposed metamorphosis. Many unforeseen accidents may doubtless arise. Alas! It is easier for me in all the glow of paternal anxiety. Reclined on my bed, to form the theory of my future conduct, than to reduce my schemes into practice. But when once secluded from the great society to which we now belong, we shall unite closer together, and there will be less room for jealousies or contentions. As I intend my children neither for the law nor the church, but for the cultivation of the land. I wish them no literary accomplishments, I pray heaven that they may be one day nothing more than expert scholars in husbandry, this is the science which made our continent to flourish more rapidly than any other. Were they to grow up where I am now situated, even admitting that we were in safety, two of them are verging toward that period in their lives, when they must necessarily take up the musket, and learn, in that new school. All the vices which are so common in armies. Great God! Close my eyes for ever, rather than I should live to see this calamity. May they rather become inhabitants of the woods. Thus then in the village of, in the bosom of that peace it has enjoyed ever since I have known it, connected with mild hospitable people, strangers to our political disputes, and having none among themselves, on the shores of a fine river, surrounded with woods, abounding with game, our little society united in perfect harmony with the new adoptive one, in which we shall be incorporated, shall rest I hope from all fatigues.
from all apprehensions, from our perfect terrors, and from our long watchings. Not a word of politics shall cloud our simple conversation, tired either with the chase or the labor of the field, we shall sleep on our mats without any distressing want, having learnt to retrench every superfluous one, we shall have but two prayers to make to the Supreme Being. That he may shed his fertilizing dew on our little crops, and that he will be pleased to restore peace to our unhappy country. These shall be the only subject of our nightly prayers, and of our daily ejaculations, and if the labor, the industry, the frugality, the union of men, can be an agreeable offering to him, we shall not fail to receive his paternal blessings. There I shall contemplate nature in her most wild and ample extent, I shall carefully study a species of society, of which I have at present but very imperfect ideas, I will endeavor to occupy with propriety that place which will enable me to enjoy the few and sufficient benefits it confers. The solitary and unconnected mode of life I have lived in my youth must fit me for this trial, I am not the first who has attempted it, Europeans did not, it is true, carry to the wilderness numerous families, they went there as mere speculators, I, as a man seeking a refuge from the desolation of war. They went there to study the manner of the Aborigines, I to conform to them, whatever they are, some went as visitors, as travelers, I as a sojourner, as a fellow hunter and laborer, go determined industriously to work up among them such a system of happiness as may be adequate to my future situation, and may be a sufficient compensation for all my fatigues and for the misfortunes I have borne. I have always found it at home, I may hope likewise to find it under the humble roof of my wigwam. O Supreme Being! If among the immense variety of planets, inhabited by thy creative power, thy paternal and omnipotent care deigns to extend to all the individuals they contain, if it be not beneath thy infinite dignity to cast thy eye on us wretched mortals. If my future felicity is not contrary to the necessary effects of those secret causes which thou hast appointed, receive the supplications of a man, to whom in thy kindness thou hast given a wife and an offspring, view us all with benignity. Sanctify this strong conflict of regrets, wishes, and other natural passions, guide our steps through these unknown paths, and bless our future mode of life. If it is good and well meant, it must proceed from thee, thou knowest, O Lord, our enterprise contains neither fraud, nor malice, nor revenge. Bestow on me that energy of conduct now become so necessary, that it may be in my power to carry the young family thou hast given me through this great trial with safety and in thy peace. Inspire me with such intentions and such rules of conduct as may be most acceptable to thee. Preserve. O God, preserve the companion of my bosom, the best gift thou hast given me, endue her with courage and strength sufficient to accomplish this perilous journey. Bless the children of our love, those portions of our hearts. I implore thy divine assistance, speak to their tender minds, and inspire them with the love of that virtue which alone can serve as the basis of their conduct in this world, and of their happiness with thee. Restore peace and concord to our poor afflicted country, assuage the fierce storm which has so long ravaged it. Permit, I beseech thee, O Father of nature, that our ancient virtues, and our industry, may not be totally lost, and that as a reward for the great toils we have made on this new land, we may be restored to our ancient tranquility, and enabled to fill it with successive generations that will constantly thank thee for the ample subsistence thou hast given them. The unreserved manner in which I have written must give you a convincing proof of that friendship and esteem, of which I am sure you never yet doubted. As members of the same society, as mutually bound by the ties of affection and old acquaintance, you certainly cannot avoid feeling for my distresses. You cannot avoid mourning with me over that load of physical and moral evil with which we are all oppressed. My own share of it I often overlook when I minutely contemplate all that hath befallen our native country. The End The End of the Letter Thank you. Thank you.